I'm revisiting the suite number five of uh, the French suite by J.S. Bach, BWB 816. It's in G major, and it has so many lyrical flowing 16th notes going through it, particularly in the right hand, you see a lot of 16th notes relentlessly. Uh, you see some dotted eighth sixteenths, but the, it seems like the common denominator in this is the is the underlying underpinning of sixteenth notes. So they have to keep flowing, but you have to do something with them, or they can become very flat out flat. So that's something I want to talk about: is how you get a phrase to have shape, flowing destinations. I also look at the underlying harmony because if I have inside a measure a dominant chord that goes over the measure into either a secondary tonic or a regular tonic, a primary key like G major. I want to dip it a little and then go forward so I don't get this false accent on what would be a resolution. It has these little dips all the way through and I'm going to try to show you where they are, where I dip back and then I go forward. It makes a difference. Also when I have repeated notes, how I don't want them to flatten out by sounding the same way like you're dropping two notes like pa pa without having a sense again of shape and where they're going, directional sense of where they're going. At the very beginning you have that two Bs that start. One is a sixteenth note that's part of an upbeat going across the measure to a longer note. And that right away is a, a motif of this piece. Is how do I do that? Because it's going to come back in various parts of the piece. And I want to know how am I executing repeated notes, one of which is a faster note value going over the measure to a longer one. What I do is I list my wrist like this. Ta-ya, ta-ya, ta-ya. Now as I'm practicing this with a trill, I'm going to do a measured trill and then when I come around to really feeling relaxed about how the flow of this is going, I will fill in with more repercussions and just let the trill go. The other thing is right away, sixteenth notes coming in over the measure, you have to keep them very steady, very steady but very flowing because it's Bach and you want a steady flow right away. So ta-ya. These are inner voices now, upper voice. Roll around to there. So you notice what I did there when I did this. What happens there is there's a stem up and then there's an under voice or an alto which has to be clearly delineated as a different line. So students will often continue a soprano line into an alto line so that we don't get the, the division of voices which you have to have. Now you might decide that you want more arm weight upstairs even though there's another voice but to the listener you definitely want to have texture with different voices because he puts the stems in different directions. So that's another consideration, was right there. Even at the beginning, one, two, three, tie on. show you what, what I was responding to. I started with tie on
considerations I had is I wanted to make sure I had the under voice that didn't merge or run into the upper voice or any other voice. I had sequences where if I have a sequence down, usually it was down, I got softer, less arm weight. If it went higher, I, I had more arm weight. You can kind of hear that. If I had repeated notes like this, came out of right in the previous measure it created a dominant to hear that always, but it comes sometimes in a very odd place. You know, we don't always want to hear dominants that are within measures. We always think that, well, it's always dominant right before into a downbeat. But sometimes it's within a measure that you have to be sensitive to it and dip your, your line a little, then go forward. There was another place here where instead of that, so we feel like that A7 chord was but he fools us and he surprises us with a dip into the parallel minor, which is D minor. So I pull it back. So I would do... To that. And again, the outline is really these tenths. That's the outline. When I block, I can hear it. So... interesting place where he goes and sequence. You can hear the sequence. And actually if I analyze it, he's going down a tritone, half step down, up a tritone, and he's stepping down now with the same idea. Down a tritone, down a half step, but up a fourth. But the listener here experiences that as a sequence. So for part one. So we wrap up the first half with that cadence of accruing voices. Actually, it's one, two, three, four, five voices at the end there. And the way you want to get that D on top, the tonic note, to survive is to push a little bit more into that, where you go, push. Okay, now you're going into the second part, which also has that motivic idea of the beginning, which was the 16th going over the measure to an upbeat to the dotted eighth. This time it's wrapped into a chord when it goes over the measure. So I would give it a little bit more. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Under, under voice. Now we're going to E minor. That's a dominant. So resolve it a little, dip it down a little, then go forward. Here's another one, another dominant. 
dominant. It's G major, dissolve it. E minor again, dissolve it. C major. what I was saying. But what's happening inside of here is uh, are a lot of um, suspended notes that come down in sequences. Here's what I mean, this one. kind of feeling what's going on harmonically and whether there are suspended notes that are falling into resolutions. And over here, this is a very characteristic place. This is a dominant of G, but it's suspended note that falls in ultimately to that. But what I do is there are three C's, so each C I make a little less because the third C falls into an anticipated resolution in the left hand earlier than it falling into it in the right hand. So resolve it down. Resolve it down. Resolve it down. And go. You can actually know when you have sequences because he's taking certain ideas down a step. It doesn't have to be a step, it can be down a skip each time. But they are little kind of um, responses that are coming down or they can be going up and the other thing to consider is common tones like you have this little place here you had it on the first page you have this sensitive. So the whole piece is very touch sensitive. I hope you get the idea of what I'm doing. It may be draped in a little bit of theoretical technical language, but you can if you can hear the sequences coming down, you're it's telling you to bring them down a bit. If you hear a dominant, it means resolve it. Now in terms of the trill, when you do you can do a lot of um, measure trill, but then ultimately you want to just let the trill go. And that's hard to do because the trill might go very fast, and then your left hand suddenly decides to go faster than keeping a beat. So that's something to where you have to master some control. So when you practice that, you can do the slow trill first, and then see if you can maintain the steady sixteenths uh, under that trill. That is your conductor hand, and let the trill go a little bit. So you can start with tie. Now I'm going to see if I can play the trill without this getting faster. Those weren't my 
like that's true. It's a little bit cold here, but at least try to control the left hand not getting faster because you have more repercussions than the right hand.